Our first interview is with Karen Hudson, a member of the Heritage Project Committee, whose main credits are costume designer for PBS Children's show Cross Galendis, shot in Texas, set costumer for Lou Grant, and women's costume supervisor for Hill Street Blues. It was a true pleasure to have Karen uh, be our first interview since she's been such a close part of getting this project off the ground. And um, we love you, Karen, and thank you for your support. Thanks. I went to Wichita State uh, University in Wichita, Kansas, where I grew up. I grew up on a farm and went to a one-room school. And (laughs) then I was working on a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts, at Wichita State. And my uh, idea was um, to be in the art department because I honestly didn't know what I was going to do. And so I said, well, I'm always good at art. I I always get an A when I have that kind of a project. And so I said, something will come along that I'll like. And I was uh, in a a drawing class one evening, and my husband was in an opera class across the street in the music department. And I went across to ride home with him. And the opera director said, "Uh, hi, Karen, nice to see you. Um, do you sew by any chance? And I said, yes. And he said, well, how well? I mean, if I gave you a drawing, could you make the thing? And I said, yeah, it doesn't make any difference. I make patterns and everything. And so that's how I got hired for my very first job. I just constructed an opera. And so I'd never designed an opera before, but I just jumped in and and did it. And um, it, it turned out really well. Actually, the first opera that I designed for was um, Falstaff and Samuel Ramey, who became a, an internationally known opera singer, uh, was my Falstaff guy. <laughs> wow. So when we were um, at later on in our years, uh, I went to New York one time and he was giving a concert. And after that, I got to go to the party on Fifth Avenue, you know, looking out. Oh, gosh, it's an incredible apartment looking out over the town, you know, and everything. And then when Sam would be in L.A. singing, he would come with me on the set. And we were on Hill Street Blues one afternoon. And he, he was standing there with his arms crossed. And he said, you know, I wish I was doing something fun like you do. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What year was that, The when you started doing well, operas with him? Oh, uh, with the operas, I think 68 something like that, 69, something like that. It was so amazing. The costume design uh, teacher gave my portfolio to this woman from the University of Texas. She said, you should uh, talk to this young woman and look at her portfolio. And she did. And she said, you know, I'd really like for you to come and think about being a student at the University of Texas the head of the costume department is my former student, Dr. Paul Reinhardt, and I'd like for you to work with him. I think that you both gain a lot. So at Christmas time, my husband and my two boys and I went to Texas, and I was interviewed by Dr. Reinhardt, and he uh, accepted me, and he said, I will give you a teaching um, assistantship. So I got paid for going to school (laughs) and in-state tuition, which was really good. And that's how I got started there. And while I was there, then Carrasco Lindas, a bilingual English-Spanish show on PBS, um, was done there at the university, and I designed that one. At that time, when I came to Hollywood, I had eight complete operas to my credit, and 84 half-hour shows on PBS, so wow. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't yeah. inexperienced Sorry. exactly, you know. <laughs> Not one bit. Yeah. yeah. On the Carrasco Linda show, we were being directed by people from New York and people from L.A., and this one man from L.A., when we finished the, um, the show, he said, why don't you and your son come on out to California and stay at my place? And uh, we'll look for a job. And actually, 10 days later, I had an interview with MTM, with the production uh, director for MTM. 
And uh, he was, I guess, impressed because he said, well, meet me at 10 minutes of 7, and I'll show you where, what stage to come to. And that was the beginning of Lou Grant. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore show had just closed the, the uh, year before that, and so they'd moved on, and Cloris Leachman had a series, and, and Ed Asner had a series, and they were moving on with that. And they just they gave me the set position. I'd never done that shit, that part before. I'd never <laughs> taken continuity and notes or anything because that wasn't a part of my job there in Texas on that show. So one of the funny things about that time was that the uh, camera uh, department, the camera uh, union, did not allow cameras on the set. So, and at that time, it was kind of new, you know, for Polaroid cameras and stuff like that anyway. But I couldn't use any kind of a camera to take any pictures or anything. So, wow. of course, because I'd been an art major, I drew, I drew, I drew. And if men had a pattern in their tie, then I would go up really close to them and, and draw the pattern of the tie. We filmed up in Griffith Park and all kinds of goofy places, you know. And um, one of the places we filmed was on Skid Row. And it was the first time I had ever been on Skid Row growing up in Kansas on a farm. That was pretty <laughs> far from what I knew. Yeah. What was it like? When I was working on Hill Street, they decided that they would have everything real. And so all of our street scenes would be on the street down there and downtown. And even they would do the interiors at locations downtown. And the first, uh, it was one of the first day or two that we were down there, they filmed inside this apartment. And when the lights made everything real hot, the room real hot, all the crickets and the ants and the rats and the mice all came out. Ugh. And the, the um, crew was just beside themselves. And they went when we went back to the studio in Studio City, um, the crew, a couple of guys from the crew, went to Stephen Bochco and they said, we will not go interior downtown anymore. Mm -hmm. You get one of these stages here and build all of the interiors because we're not going downtown anymore. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did. They got a stage and started building all the interiors. You and I were laughing about uh, the fact that that I am a method costumer and I really <laughs> love that. I've put that in my vocabulary now. So I'm a method costumer. <laughs> And I'll tell you why that happened. What a method costumer is, is one, a person who does like the actors do. When the actors go on one of these shows, it's, for instance, on Skid Row, and they don't know what the character is about and the people and the situation are about, they go there and they hang around to find out what it's like. And I used to go to the secondhand stores in the bad areas of L.A. and you know, look at the people, watch the people. I'd act like I was shopping, you know, pick up a piece and look at it. And, but I was really looking at the people more. One of the reasons why I did that was because I'm dyslexic and I don't read very well. And so going through magazines are, are the, about the only thing I can read because the writing is narrow. This was perfect for me, you know, because I learn by seeing, and that's what I need to do. And that's one reason why I was pretty good at um, uh, continuity, because I, I learn by looking, by seeing, and that's what continuity is about, too. How did you go from, from Lou Grant to Hill Street Blues? Oh, well, Abby Singer, who was one of the most famous production people, and uh, he, he led the production for all of MTM, and everyone knows who Abby Singer is. Anyway, um, I think what he saw was that I knew how to do so many things that I could be a real asset to the company. And so when they brought this new show in that was a really big challenge, then he moved me over there. At the time, I, the dialogue about hiring someone like me because I you know, didn't have 
I didn't have any credits out here, you know, and all that, was uh, that the production manager called the union and said, I have somebody new who is not in the union. I want to put her name into the union. And this is the point. We have let uh, two people go, and we don't have any connections right now to anybody and we need for tomorrow morning we need a customer and this person is qualified so this is kind of an emergency hire and that's how I got in because that unit manager was standing behind me and pushing on the union. What was the union like at the time? Did you know anything about it or was it just a prerequisite no, for the job? No, I didn't. Yeah, it was a prerequisite for that job. I wasn't, didn't know to go after a union job rather than um you know, some other job. I didn't know that. So I was really lucky in that situation, you know, that they needed the person that I could be at the right moment when I was there. The dress suit that the cops wore was actually, I believe, New York City police officers. And then for the street, it was, I believe it was Chicago. And I know that the hat was Chicago. And people ask me this almost every month, someone asked me this. Well, what was Hill Street based on? What uh, city <laughs> was, were the police state as? And the thing was that, um, uh, Stephen Bochco said, this is not a particular city. We have invented this. It is an unknown northeastern city, mm. period. And don't ask any more questions because there are no other answers. <laughs> <laughs> did not want to commit. Well, I think it left it open so we could mm -hmm. invent whatever we wanted to invent. What did the rest of your department look like? Did you have a bunch of shoppers and no. costumers <laughs> at that time no <laughs> um no what we had um bob and i did the, the shopping and the f fittings and all that sort of thing and then um we had uh two set people and that was it there were four people of us doing that show there was nothing ever anything like a shopper what was your um title in hill street blues were you the costume designer or costume supervisor costume women's costume supervisor and was there a designer at the time no. That, no. that was you yeah. basically yeah it's so different now you so have designers different. in television now which i guess that wasn't a thing oh for yeah a that long wasn't time. no it wasn't when there weren't <laughs> designers in television when i was doing hill street no you couldn't make a drawing and hand it to the uh to the um tailor shop or whatever to have it made you couldn't make it so you would have to go off of like a sears catalog or like a well, like I'd have to find I'd have to find it either reference. to buy or to find it in in a rental house. Okay, so you couldn't like hire a, a designer for that specific thing or an illustrator no, even. No. My very favorite costume that I ever did was this um, lady. She was the the night um, cleanup person, you know, the janitor. And she had walked into an office, and the boss at the office, the president of the company, was dead, was, had fallen forward on his desk and was dead. And she ran out and called the police to come. And when the police came in, it was nighttime, and so it was all dark in the building. And the hallway at the back uh, was all lit up, and that's where the office was at the back. And I saw the lady, she was screaming, come this way, this way. And she was uh, fanning a, a rag in the, in the air, you know, and she was screaming and crying and everything. And she was like a, like a silhouette. And I could tell from the shape when she was running, the shape of the legs and, and her arm up in the air, I could tell that she was the cleaning lady. And, and I, I just was so thrilled by that that you could see a silhouette and know what it was. How did you see the industry change in, in any way while you were in it? Well, um, you know, the, the big thing was making the women, the you know, women's uh, income equal. And that kind of represents the whole thing. I, I saw women come in and be doing more 
um, things, you know, being having a little more control, a little more power, and so forth. We've interviewed, um, for example, Mary Ellen before, where she was commenting how before she got into the industry, she was a school teacher, mm-hmm. and school teachers, even in the mid seventies, weren't allowed to wear pants mm-hmm. <laughs> to school. <laughs> no, no, which honestly blew my mind. <laughs> you see, that just reflects how society was. It wasn't unique. To the film industry, it was society. During your time, did you see, were women less uh, present in the in a costume department before than they were later on? Or? Yeah. At one point, and this I think kind of ended when I got there, men on the set could not help the women and women could not help the men. It was very, very strongly separated that way. And when uh, I was working on Lou Grant, Ed Asner had, you know, was the head of that show, and so he has, he was in every scene of the show. He had so much dialogue to learn all the time that they said, Karen, uh, we want you, you have fewer women, because, you know, that was uh, a show that had very few women on it, so you um, take over Uh, making sure that Ed is in his right clothes because he would uh, go into the dressing room and, you know, I would lay out the the wardrobe on the sofa and he would be rehearsing his lines and he'd take his tie off and his shirt and everything and throw it over on the sofa and then he'd still be doing it and he'd start uh, changing his pants and then go over and pick up a shirt and put it on in a tie and many times he'd pick up the same thing he had on before. So they said to me, go with him and be sure that he comes back here to the set in the right clothes. When I talk about how I came from, well, a friend of mine says, Karen, your, your uh, life story is outhouse to penthouse, you know, because I went to a one-room school in Wichita. We had outhouses, and, and uh, we had a big wood stove, and, you know, we didn't, um, we had water in a bucket. You took your, your glass and put water in it, and there was no running water, yeah. you know, and, and then... You're in the penthouse in in Los Angeles in the film industry, you know, so outhouse to penthouse. (laughs) And when I think back, how did you do that? The fact is that I've never been afraid of taking a chance. And so when somebody mentions something that's kind of interesting and sort of moving forward, I just say yes. And like I've told you, there were many times that I had no idea what I was doing and, and I just stepped in and figured it out.